This is the Seven Figure Agency Podcast. Discover the strategies and techniques to grow a highly successful and profitable digital marketing agency with your host, Josh Nelson. Cast where we're interviewing highly successful digital marketing agencies from across the country on how they're growing and scaling their digital marketing agencies. I'm super excited today to be joined by Brad Ferris from Clinic Growers and Agency Growth Team. Um, he's built a really successful seven-figure agency serving the, the healthcare space. He's also got an amazing, uh, amazing background in building account management teams, hiring, recruiting, training account managers. Um, he's worked closely with me and our agency, works with a lot of our seven-figure agency members. So super excited to have Brad on the show today. Brad, say hello. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Josh. So let's start with this. Um, just kind of give the Cliff Notes version of what clinic grower is, kind of what your business is about, and kind of how many clients you're serving today, or kind of yep. what the current MRR is. Yeah, so we're just shy of Titan status, if anyone knows what that is. Um, so we're about 153,000 um, um, uh, monthly recurring. We don't count the revenue between the two agencies, so that's just, just clinic grower. Nice. Um, we have about 58 clients. So obviously, if people are doing the math, a lot of our clients are at a fairly hefty retainer. Um, and the history of our agency has always been just like, I think many others, you try things, you experience different things, right? You, you're in different mastermind groups. And obviously we've, we've, we've grown a lot since we've been able to join seven figure. And I think our goal a lot of the time has been listening to our clients and what are the problems that we solve for them. So one of the things that we've kind of coined is we are, we're responsible from click to consult which is great because basically it's, we're doing all the lead generation, we're doing all the booking, we're even collecting those prepayments with some of the crazy, awesome things that high level has put in place. And then the practice is responsible for, you know, everything that happens once the patient walks in the door. Love it. So congratulations on building a, a seven figure, almost multiple seven figure agency, soon to be seven fig, multiple seven figure agency in that space. Um, I think healthcare, is one of the hardest niches, right? It's, it's hard to get their attention. It's hard to get the clients. Talk a little bit about why you chose that niche, if you could, and kind of how you landed on, you know, cosmetic healthcare, basically. Yeah, well, Brett had, Brett had actually um, formed the agency, my business partner, before I had joined. So he had the agency for about two years before I joined in 2019. Um, and I think, you know, healthcare, I mean, there's a lot of people that make a lot of money in healthcare, right? Um, I have a registered nurse background. I, I had already scaled practices. Um, I was working in private equity at the time that I, I joined up with Breath. And, you know, I think in our first maybe two years, we were also kind of like trying to figure that out too. Like we did a little bit of dentistry. We did some pain clinics. We did a lot of vein. Um, vein and vascular is still a big component of what we do. And um, we got into conversations with clients eventually that are obviously spending a lot more money than other clients. And it was like, hey, like, you know, like people that are spending a lot more money tend to be really good clients. They tend to be good at their business because that's how they got to the point of being able to spend all that money. And uh, we made the pivot this year to just really focus exclusively on scaling in the aesthetic um, niche, which is plastic surgery and, and large med spas. And uh, it's been great. They're great clients. Our team likes working with them. They pay their bills. You know, it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's not perfect, but I mean, it's, it's been a little bit of a refresh. Love it. So great niche. Again, hard to, hard to work in. If you could share any tips, and we're going to get into account management stuff, which if you're excited to hear how to build a, a world-class account management team, just type yes into the comments. I know there's a bunch of you guys watching with us live. Um, how do you, like, how do you get the attention of the owner of, these high-end aesthetic practices? Yeah, so great question, thanks. Um, I think I've always had my eye on the fact that we can't just be one channel focused. Mm -hmm. So at any given time, we're running Facebook ads just like everyone else's. Um, we've got Google campaigns, we're running LinkedIn lead magnets. Um, I have LinkedIn outreach. We're attending you know, industry events, as I know, for a lot of some bigger agency. Um, you know, that, that's huge, being, being yeah. in front of your avatar directly live in person. And I think a lot of it has been, you know, we've been very fortunate to get some great clients that will sing our praises rather than having to force them, you know, to kind of sing the praises. And, you know, this year we've probably seen about maybe 15, 20% of our, of our new clients come from referrals directly. Um, obviously the, the, the ad spend is great because you're saving, but what you're trading that with is a huge investment of time in those existing clients. But I mean, it's been great. I mean, someone already coming to you knowing that you've achieved is way different than someone saying, well, are you going to achieve? 
right? So um, that, that's been huge for us. So it sounds like, for, especially in your niche, and I think this applies in, in every niche, but it sounds like leveraging the attraction model where you're putting out content, you're showing up where they hang out, you're getting your case studies out there in advance and letting these practice owners come to you and be like, well, I've heard you guys do good work. Um, has worked much better than a chase mode work where you're cold email, cold DM, cold calling to try and get these practices to, to do business with you. A great example is we were at a, an event in June and um, I was at the booth talking. We we're about to hopefully, fingers crossed, sign a very large strategic partnership. Um, and that booth was expressing, hey, they were having a hard time selling these medical devices to doctors. And I said, Breath, tell everyone that I'm doing a, at our booth, I'm doing a workshop, right? And it was funny because I'm surrounded by this company's reps on one side and other company's reps on another. I'm in front of my laptop. Every single one of those people we connected with, we connect, we, we found out who their boss was, keep going up that chain for the relationship. Um, you know, that old school grind model still works really well today. Love it. Some, some great insights there. So if you're, if you're listening to this, you're like, Hey, you know, if you're just playing the cold outreach formula and you're just making cold calls, you know, start to put out some content, start to be at the events, start to look for opportunities to speak in front of the stage. It will make your life easier, whether you're in medical, legal, home services, whatever niche you happen to be in. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about how you land clients. We'd love to talk a little bit about the, like kind of the service offering. Um, you know, what, it, what's the mix? Is it website, SEO, pay-per-click, marketing automation? Just talk us through kind of what the typical package is for one of your clients. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't scale smart. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> so, if you're in, so if you're in seven figure and you're listening to what Josh is talking about, I mean, do what Josh teaches. Um, we really built the first seven figures of the agency off of Facebook ads, we all, literally exclusively. Um, and of course we were always aware that that one trick kind of, you know, could, could, could cost us at some point if the platform changes. And as everyone knows, we're in Q4, Facebook's being temperamental and you kind of, you know, you reevaluate. So we do now offer website SEO. We have an appointment booking concierge team that mm -hmm. calls the leads because our clients were horrible at calling their leads. Mm -hmm. Um, if anything, our clients were asking us for a 24 seven service because I mean, they were willing to pay that extra. And um, it's it's been it's been Facebook and Google. Um, we haven't really gone into TikTok or YouTube. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, I think, on the two platforms that we're on right now. But the whole goal for us is we want to be able to, as we scale to that eight-figure agency, yep. really be that one stop. Um, mo most of our clients are working with multiple vendors, and what we've realized is with the concierge team, we're not just booking our leads, but we're booking leads for other people. Um, for other vendors, for that doctor. So that actually makes us more valuable. Yeah. We're a little bit low, we're a lot lower on the list of who they're gonna get rid of um, if something happens. I, th I think it's a powerful share, um, you know, kind of going from just doing lead gen, you know, and that's what a lot of agencies maybe just do Facebook or they just do Google ads. Um, and while, while that's easy to systematize at some level, your retention starts to struggle, your ability to consistently generate results start to struggle. And what I found in you know, working with a lot of different agencies now is adding multiple channel, even if you just add one or two additional components, you've got more diversification in terms of what's gonna generate the result for the client. Um, and you, you, you've got just a much better chance of retaining the relationship. Have you found that that had an impact as you started to expand the offering a little bit? Yeah, well, I think the biggest thing that it made an impact for us was um, because we were so heavily reliant on Facebook, we were we were cold intent, right? And just adding a little bit of warmer intent from the website, from the SEO, from even the Google, because obviously that's super warm. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, this is why all those boring agencies are doing the boring stuff because it, you know, th those leads book, those leads um, can carry the intent farther when someone isn't calling them right away. Facebook, you live and die by, you know, is that person going to take the action themselves or do you have the ability to reach them right away and convert them in a sales process? So yeah, we were like, probably makes a lot of sense for us to start changing the temperature of the lead flow. And that's what we noticed was a big impact for us. Love it. Yeah. You get some of the, the lower hanging like fruit, the opportunities that they were going to get and you've just helped push them over. And when you combine that with a great ad strategy and you combine that with some of the other things, you become much more bulletproof in terms of your results. And, and of course, when you're crushing it for the client, they're gonna stay, they're gonna refer. Um, you did something else that I think is really smart and you've implemented this concierge program. It's easy as agency owners to say, ah, oh, you know what, I'm gonna generate the lead and if they can't convert it, that's their problem, right? But I think as a smart entrepreneurs, you and Bref said, 
if there's a problem here, there's a problem that they don't have a good sales team on the phone to answer, to book the call, um, and you, you solve that problem for your clients, and it's, it's you know created new revenue streams for your agency. What were some of the key lessons as you implemented that, um, and and how has it impacted your retention and your ability to grow? Um, I think the first thing we realized when we went through and made the business case, because I'm 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 uh, accuracy breakfast speed, so I'm the boring guy that's like, hey, business plan. So he's the stuff. visionary, and you're the the integrator, like really actually making things get done. Right. One of the one of the things that we really conscious of is we didn't want to be the person that just came in and said, "Hey, your team sucks." Because I think again, it's easy to to throw that on them. Right. One of the things that we've really differentiated in our value proposition is your team is good or great, but they're only one person. So when that phone rings, you only have one person available to answer that phone. So if you got two calls, now what do you do? If you have three calls, now what do you do? That person's checking in a client, taking a payment, they have to go to the bathroom. So the way that we've always presented it is let us be that redundancy, right? We have the, we have the 27 agents that are available to take those calls, right? Like how much does that impact your business to be able to say, we can take 27 simultaneous calls with a real person trained on your business that can take a payment, obviously through high level, because that's amazing. Um, and I think that was the really big differentiator was we did, they didn't feel, the teams didn't feel attacked it's surely a, a full partnership approach, um, but it also made sense to the business owner to say, yeah, like I can't have her answer three calls at the same time. Two people have to be on hold. So, oh, you're going to do that for me. And then the after hours and all the other stuff, it, you know, we just we're really good marketers at marketing it as a service. Super good. Uh, great insight there. Easier said than done. Right. A lot of agencies have had this light bulb. Oh, yeah, I should I should put a call center. Um, but the actual hiring the people, training them, and putting the redundancies in place, kudos to you guys for pulling it off. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how do you go to the market with that? Is that every client has to use the concierge, or do you have it as an upsell? Can someone buy it standalone if they just wanted that? How does that play into your business model? Thank you. So initially it was an upsell, right? Um, and then it was uh, we moved it to an alternative suggested. Um, now it's mentoring. Um, at the end of the day, every business is going to have overflow. So we just basically say, hey, you're paying us to be there as a backup. And if you want us to take on more, fabulous. And we're really transparent with our clients. Basically, it's the cost of us to have that agent. Plus, we say a margin of 30%, which I think most people is fair. And then if they go over top of what that person needs, we have an overage um, to, to, to basically come into play. So it allows the client to know, oh, here's what I'm paying for right? Here's what you earn as a business to do it, right? Here's the minutes or hours or whatever usage you want to have. And if I want to go over that, it's really easy for me to calculate what I need to spend. So we actually have a lot of clients right now really pushing hard on Q4, right? Looking for results. And they actually came to us and they said, hey, we need to purchase this many hours and we need uh, 1.8 agents for the next eight weeks. Um, you know, can that get started on Monday? They actually really enjoyed having that opportunity to take a look at it and to plan because guess what? Just like the fam famous Tony Ricketts said, right? Some of these guys don't have a plan um, and they, they need to have one. And I think a lot of the time we're helping them with stuff like that. Love it. Su super good. And, and I think it's great that we're going down this track because I think a lot of agencies should be solving this for their clients. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's things to think through. Uh, Michael's asking, what's the typical fee for this, um, for the call service? I know you just said whatever the cost is plus 30%. Any more specifics on like what that actually costs? Yeah. So when we first did, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be fully transparent. When we first did it, um, we calculated at the time in 2021 that probably a part-time person at the front desk of a business would be about $2,000 a month, right? And what we said to them was, hey, if we offered this to you at $500 a month, right? And I think at the time we were doing four hours of talk time or something like that, because High Level didn't even have that as a calculation inside of right. the reporting. Um, we just kind of said like, you know, you'll get that person for 500 bucks, it's this many leads. And then as soon as high level, thanks high level for, um, if you go into your agency dashboard, you can see phone usage now. Um, and that's about six months old. We changed the model right away to minutes, like cost, cost per minute, price per minute. Um, and it's great for the client. They have the transparency of seeing exactly what they're using. Um, they know exactly what our charges are going to be. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You could charge. 
per hour, per minute, you could do per labor. We, we just really like the hybrid. And for us, that's a good fit for our clients to know that the labor, they're paying for the labor to sit there and be available. And then whatever we use, you know, that's where we're making a little bit of profit. Love it. So, so if I understand correctly, it's, it's a flat rate of um, 500 bucks a month plus a per minute charge, or did I totally miss that? No, nope. so I'll go back. Sorry, my apologies. So when we first started, it was just five hundred dollars flat. Right? Okay, and then you're like, wait, we need to make an incremental here. Yeah. Now what we do for transparency is we don't tell them the cost of it because it's included in our service. But what mm -hmm. we do is we give them a set number of hours um, or minutes essentially, and we say if you go over that, it's say two dollars a minute or two twenty five a minute. Um, and you know, I I wouldn't want to disclose how we make good profit off of that business model, and obviously we invested heavily to grow it. Um, I don't necessarily want all my clients knowing what it costs. Um, but again, when you're adding it in with an SEO and a website and another advertising campaign, it makes it a little bit easier to kind of take the 200 or the 300 and, and kind of pull it as a business unit. In. Absolutely. Love that. And I think it, it solves a problem for the client, creates an additional revenue stream for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how it's in, Do you feel like it has? Obviously, you mentioned profitability. Has it had an impact on your ability to retain clients that might have otherwise left? Yeah. So when we first started it, it was you know two or three clients that wanted to try it out. I would have to do a number now, but we probably have 24, 26 of our 58 clients on that service in some capacity. Wow. Some of them are just using it for after hours. Some are using it as their core. We call every single lead. We answer every single phone. Um, there's a, there's that variability across it, but because we've got a really good pricing model, we're, we're making a good profit. And again, if you, if you know, we, we don't need to make 60 or 70% on it. 30% is actually, that is our profit margin. Um, but that allows us to take that and invest into other parts of the agency. Love it. Michael's asking a follow up. Um, are these, are these U S based operators or international or does it matter? We actually do a mix of all of that. So we have um, individuals here in the United States and Canada. We have people in Central South America. We have people in South Africa and the Philippines. Um, the idea that we had was, I, you know, I've been very transparent. <laughs> I was a shift worker earlier in my career as a nurse and you don't do your best job at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Um, so we actually have it um, designed that as we go through the day for our clients in the five time zones that we serve here in North America, we have different team members coming online it actually makes me, again, do a really good job explaining to the client why that is. Then they don't mind that a Filipino agent's on the phone at nine o'clock at night um, because they're not dealing with someone somewhere else where it's, you know, or, or like middle of the night for them and they're just doing a really bad job on the call. But I would say during the, during the meat of the day, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a North American call agent that's on the phone. Love it. Good, good stuff. Good answers there. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, Michael, thanks for chiming in. Guys, if you have questions, we want them, right? This is live. So interact with us live. We'll be glad to engage with these questions. Um, so thanks for sharing kind of like what the program looks like, how you're landing clients. Uh, would love to shift gears now to your specialty, which is building an account management team and really how to, how to hire client success, how to cl hire account managers. Um, you know, as you grow and as you scale your agency, I think the first position you remove yourself from is operations, right? You want to get out of that and have an operations team and operations management. The second position usually is your account management, which is talking to the clients, reviewing the reports, setting expectations and, and doing the work to retain that client base at the highest level possible. And one of those positions that is not super easy to do well, right? We can hire someone, but how do we get the right person? How do we get them placed? So if you want some great insights from Brad, who's basically helped us re-engineer our entire account management team and has put on masterclass for the entire seven-figure agency community on how to do this, type account managers in the comments and get ready for some great nuggets. So uh, Brad, talk to us a little bit about when it comes to the account management role, like before we think about recruiting and before we think about placement, um, like what, like how should they be thinking about the account management role and, and expectations for that position? Yeah. So. It's a loaded question, of course, because <laughs> I think because I think an account manager needs to be good and strong in a lot of different areas. I mean, obviously, um, as I mentioned before, they have one foot inside the agency. They're representing the agency. They're wearing the you know the badge of the of the agency on their shirt. In, in our agency, we say that we bleed green, right? Because Clinic Grow is a green company. Um, you're also looking at someone who can handle fires, right? They can negotiate a little bit. They can you know kind of 
pump and, and get a client excited about doing something that maybe it's really hard. Maybe that client just doesn't want to do it. So a lot of the time I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, I kind of want a, an account manager to be someone who's actually probably sales, but they're not a great closer, right? They couldn't actually take a deal over the line just because maybe they don't have that um, pedigree or that drive, but they, they can sell a client on why they should stay with an agency paying us every single month, right? And, and referring people and, you know, getting, getting reviews and testimonials and stuff like that. So um, the things that I'm looking for a lot of the time, I'm looking for someone with really high drive, really high follow through. I'm looking for someone with a lot of emotional intelligence. They're dealing with people every day. So, you know, how they communicate stuff through email, Loom, um, on, on Zoom or video. Um, obviously, I, you know, I'm biased. I pick people that are usually attractive. I find that clients like to talk to attractive people. Um, and people that are pretty articulate and, and, and well-educated, but we've had client, we've had account managers, client success managers come from hospitality, come from industry, right. In terms of marketing backgrounds. Um, I, I've even trained people that have done web development that want to get into client facing roles. Um, if that person's going to put in the time, put in the work, they really, really love dealing with clients. I mean, that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I think, like you said, it's a unique mix. You need someone that cares about marketing and kind of enjoys the technical side and can have those conversations, uh, but also someone that's nurturing and caring, but also someone that's got a little bit of a, a backbone that can ask for an upsell, that can ask for a review. Um, specifically to the account management position in, in your mind, um, you know, there's account managers and client success team that maybe that actually build campaigns and do the work in addition to interfacing with the client. Uh, and then there's you know, a true, like a direct account manager, which is more just client facing, doing the Zoom meetings, and then working with the team to make sure the stuff gets done. How do you see that in your agency? Like, are they are they doing work or are they managing relationships? Another great question. Um, so I actually try my hardest to take a big step back and to take every tool that I personally have in my toolbox as an agency owner and lay it on the floor. And I think that gives me a really good perspective of how to answer that question with my team, because you, my, you know, me, Josh, most of us, we're the unicorns, right? That's why we own the agency. We can do a little bit of everything. We understand it. We're high capacity people. I may be bringing somebody in that really doesn't understand how a chat widget on a website works. So you're going to train that person, right? But that's totally different than then coding into Elementor, right? Or <laughs> launching a Facebook campaign. Or or, title you know, tags and H1 yeah. tags and meta descriptions, yeah. right? So, so I think one of the things that we do as we scale is we're, we're, we have multiple needs and we're trying to see if someone can fit into that. And what I, I think what I loved about what you said earlier is, you know, if you think about getting yourself just out of operations, then you're creating a task of operations and giving to a person. And you're probably still doing more than you really want to do. Um, but it's got to support that person, right? You have to be able to give them the ability, the training, and the knowledge that they need. So if you're bringing someone in, you know, say you have an SEO agency and that person was a product manager before on SEO, that's a, that's a great find, right? If you can get that person, amazing. The reality is that most of the people that are going to apply to that position are either a little bit more technical or they're a little bit more strong on client facing, getting that middle ground. So one of the things I advocate for is, Sometimes when you're building a team, you're just going to pick the best person at that time that fits, you know, what you're needing. And then you can build around that. So like for me, I do have a technical product person on my team, but I also have someone who's really high touch point, really high relationship. And then I have my negotiator. I have my person that can come in, deescalate any given client at any given time. Great, great kind of, you know, um, skill set in terms of that. But each of those three are actually quite different, right? Um, mm -hmm. One of them's good at understanding how the Facebook campaigns are working. Another one would be like, ah, I don't really, I'm just going to go talk to this client, and get an upsell. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, that that's a strategy I often talk about in terms of it works for us. Doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Um, but we, you know, I always say when I'm doing the, the classes, it's tasks, not titles. So mm -hmm. just look at. The list of tasks that you're going to give that person, are they going to be successful? What would they require to be able to do it? And usually it's pretty obvious that, you know, they can't be doing something that you really want them to be doing. Yeah, I think it's a great, it's a great answer. And, and, you know, in my mind, the way we've structured it at Plumbing and HVAC SEO, we've got technical staff that do the work. We've got account managers that talk to the clients and review the reports and kind of the liaison between the, the team and, uh, and the client themselves. Uh, what I found was the, the people that are good with, content writing with SEO, with pay-per-click 
are they tend to be really good at that and they enjoy it, but their personality type doesn't lend itself to wanting to talk to the clients and be, you know, kind of charismatic and likable. Um, and so I found it works really well to have like my, my client facing people are over here. They got a personality, they, they, you know, they've got some charisma um, and, and putting them in, the, in their strengths. But I have seen the spectrum and some of the most successful agencies in the program, you know, they have account managers that do set up Facebook ads and set up funnels and stuff. And they also manage the relationship. Um, and in so doing, they've got a better handle on what's going on with that campaign. They can have a more confident conversation. So I could see it go both ways. And I like what you said there, like, see what you need and, and what talent you've got available and kind of build around that. It's good. Yeah, it's going to depend on the agency. Um, it's, it's largely going to depend on the agency because how I scale clinic grower is going to be different than scaling even another medical agency that was a, a different product offering. Yeah. No doubt. I think this is a good question, and I think it's going to depend on um, it's going to depend upon how you've structured it. But they're asking, what's a good ratio from client to account manager? I've got a number. I'd love to hear your number. So I'm not actually going to answer the question. Okay. Um, but what I think is important before I answer it, and maybe we'll get that from the individual in the audience, is I think there's a couple things for you to consider first before we answer it. Number one is what does your onboarding process look like in terms mm. of how much time. Um, how much flow is coming through, right? Because obviously if your onboarding is heavy and you've got a high flow rate, you are going to need more resources, right? Mm -hmm. You actually might need triple the client success managers or account managers that I have. Yeah. I think the other thing is going to be what's the, what's the lifetime value of that client. Um, you know, everyone, Avery Lynch asked a great question the other day and I had a comment. So like, what's the most important metric to an agency? And he was trying to basically say it's LTV. Um, if we are a SaaS agency, LTV, that, that's not going to be massively high. So maybe you have, you know, a very high ratio of clients to account manager. For me, my LTV is easily one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars for some of our clients. So my ratios are actually going to be quite low. Our account managers um, for Clinic Grower, we actually calculate it based on how much revenue are they responsible for. Um, mm. So for each one of them, um, you know, they're probably doing eighteen to twenty clients that would be fairly low in a lot of agencies in terms of, you know, like the number of clients that they hold, but the amount of revenue, like one of our, one of our team members is responsible for about 73 K a month. Um, and that to me is good. I mean, with her 18 clients, that's more than enough. Um, she, I don't really want her taking on anymore. I'd rather hire another person to take the next four clients to that high LTV. And that makes a lot of sense for me. So, you know, what is the ratio? Again, I think it comes down to what is best for your agency and how have you designed it? And those are the questions I'd probably be asking before I give an answer. 100%. And, and, and I agree. I think it depends, right? Depends upon, like we said before, is the account manager launching clients? Are they actually setting up Facebook campaigns? In, in which case, they probably have a lot less, right? Um, or yeah, a lot less. Are they just talking to clients and doing monthly reviews and then kicking things over the fence? then they should be able to handle more. Like in our world, typically we're shooting for 25 to 30 accounts per account manager. And that's the expectation that they're gonna be meeting with every client every month. They're gonna be touching them several times per month. They're gonna take copious notes. Every, every client request is gonna get immediate follow up and follow through. Uh, and they're gonna be working with the team, not just like managing the to-dos, but managing the strategy. Hey, they're not ranking. What's the SEO team doing? Hey, the pay-per-click campaign's not performing. They're not changing it, but they're running the strategy so they can have those intelligent conversations. And what I find is if they start to get much more than 30, 35 clients, something starts to tail off. They don't have a bandwidth for all those clients. One thing, if I could add, I also think for the person that's asking this question, that's important. We spend a lot of time in our, we have a, we have a training program inside of agency growth team that you can purchase if you have an existing person, is it's also about the efficiency of your team. Right. So one of the things that I noticed for a lot of, I, I'm a coach inside of some figures. I get a lot of, you know, people coming in and asking for a little bit of the time to coach on it. And I'll ask them like, are, is your team doing what we call a call for agenda? Are you before that meeting, Josh, like, are we saying to the client, what do you want to discuss? What are the items that you want to go over and cover? And we have our list as well. Um, but then that person is coming to that call prepared. They're, they may be bringing a technical person with them for support if needed, rather than getting bushwhacked and, and having no idea what the client wants to cover. And I think sometimes as agency owners, we watch that call and we go, oh man, like, hey, like that person really didn't know how to answer that question, but it's not necessarily the person's fault. We didn't have the right like structure in place to prepare that person to be able to answer that question. So that was one of the things that like our, 
our clients ask super horrible technical things on their calls, um, which is why for us that call to agenda is vital. And if a client comes to that call, if you guys have been an AGT client, you know that it's one of the things that we have as a resource. We just say to them, hey, thanks so much for bringing that up. It wasn't on our agenda. I'm happy to get back to you in 24 to 48 hours. We just let them know that we're not prepared to answer that. And they couldn't ask, you know, they couldn't actually expect us to answer it because we, we asked them, what do you want to cover? Yeah, I think that's really smart. And it kind of protects the account manager from the pressure of, I don't know. And also it protects them from saying, let me go check with XYZ and bring them on the call. Because what we found is the second you start to bring that pay-per-click specialist on the call, um, the client loses all respect for their account manager. Like, hey, let me get, can I just talk to that dude? Because he seems, or that gal, she seems like she knows what's actually going on. So they need to protect their status as the, the account lead. And I think that's a smart way to do that. Yep. Perfect. All right. So we talked about the account management role, kind of high level. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about how do you, how do you recruit these people? Like, how do we find smart, driven, well-spoken, good-looking people, as you say, uh, to step in and to, to handle this role for you? Yeah. So um, when I've done my presentations, I challenge agency owners to think of this as a sales process because it is. We're trying to sell the best people in the world for the best price to come and work for us with our clients because obviously that's vitally important. Um, so if you're old school like me, you know what a VSL video sales letter is. Um, if you know who Dan Kennedy is in terms of long form kind of old school sales letter, that's what our job postings look like. I'm telling the story I'm inspiring the right people. I'm telling them exactly what the role is going to look like. I'm not shying away and sugarcoating it. I'm saying you will do this and you'll be responsible for that. Um, and I think that that's really important because if we don't give the person the clarity, how are they going to know whether it's a good fit and we're going to know either. Um, I'm posting probably in multiple countries, multiple platforms. I'm setting a budget just like I would if I was doing a, a, an ad campaign. And I'm probably deciding, you know, do I need 200 candidates, 300, 400? Sometimes I'm going to need that many to find the one or two that are really, really good. I think a lot of agencies, you know, they get 40 applications. And I'm just going to be like, hey, that's probably actually not enough to really, like, you could be fortunate. Josh has a great hire that, you know, was literally in that 40. We knew it right away. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time, you know, like you're going to settle for something that you shouldn't settle for. Um, and depending on where you're posting, LinkedIn, Indeed, um, I mean, there's uh, PH jobs. There's like, you know, there's unlimited people out there that want to now work remotely. So if anything, it's a super exciting time for an agency because it's like, you know, we, we have the best business model going right now. Um, did that answer that question, Josh? I got off track probably. No, I, I think that's great. I think, you know, obviously going to post in all the places, have a clear job description, uh, and then sell the position, right? Like, don't just post a, hey, I need an account manager to talk to my clients um, and keep them on board, right? Sell them on the opportunity. Sell them on the sizzle of the digital marketing space. Um, yep. I think your, your team does an amazing job crafting that. Um, so we're, we're, you know, promoting it. I think you said something there important that 99% of agencies and, pers you know, uh, entrepreneurs don't do, which is to actually know we're going to have to vet a lot of people to find the, the really great candidates. Um, unfortunately, most agency owners are quick start and it's like, I need an account manager. And so we put an ad up and the, like the first person that gets on the Zoom is like, okay, good enough. Check, hired. And that's a recipe for having a revolving door in your account management process, which is going to lead to a revolving door in your client retention, which is going to like really bog down your business. Um, so I think, I think it's important to like understand the right way to recruit account managers. If you want to grow and scale, you may not want to do this yourself. Um, you know, one of, I forget where it was. I heard this interview with Mark Cuban. He said, you know, he was asked like, what's the best way to build a, a team of eight players? And he says, hire a world-class recruiting service, right? Find someone that knows how to attract that talent and will put the, the energy in. Um, and that's why I think having Brad as an option is so powerful because he's got a great process. He knows exactly what he's looking for. He's got a lot of experience in the agency space. Um, and it, he and his team will put the energy in to serve you the right candidates that can make all the difference in, um, in whether you've got good people that are retaining clients and upselling versus you know, putting some random person in that's going to stick around for three to six months, frustrate your client base, uh, and probably wind up leaving the organization anyways. Yeah. And, and I think one of the important points I want to add there too is, 
you know, we, we call ourselves a recruitment agency because there's not really another word I'd come up with it at all. But I think the other thing too, that's important to distinguish us is we train and support that person for the long term inside of your agency. So if you're gonna have the time to train that person, um, check in with them on a regular basis, you, you know, you're gonna be the director of account management, um, that's great. If not, there's a fractional component that we have available where it's your, it's your asset, it's your employee, you've hired them but they can come to our coaching sessions, right? They can they can be coached inside of the seven figure coaching calls that I have um, or the one-on-ones. I think a lot of the time we need that body, you're right. And then we move on to something else and we don't end up supporting that person and they either leave or they languish or they don't perform the way that we're expecting them to. And then we're like, oh, that person sucked. And it's like, well, you know, we brought them in, right? We convinced them to come into the agency. So we bear a lot of that responsibility. Yeah, I think that's important, right? Like if you're going to hire them, make sure you got a plan to train them and to keep them engaged. And if you don't, like you need to find a resource to plug in those to plug in those gaps, right? Otherwise, they are going to struggle. Um, so, OK, cool. We'll talk a little bit about recruiting. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the like the interview questions you ask and or assessments that you run to, to vet a quality candidate? Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm, I'm the most spontaneous, they can't prepare for my interviews. I feel, you know, to a certain degree bad, but actually I, I presented this to a very controversial crowd. Of course, as you remember, Josh, um, I had said like, don't ask questions about um, what went on in the past. One, mm -hmm. how do you know that it's true or not? It, it could be a hundred percent false. I'm very future focused and I'm going to ask questions about that. So I might, you know, spontaneously just say, bring, bring, and the person, oh, call, there's a client calling. How do you want to answer it? Walk me through. I guess I'm going to train that person, right, in, in fairness on how to do it. But I kind of, I'm very interested in what their innate skills are going to be, right? I'm going to give them a situation that I struggle with right now, right? Maybe I have a client who's sitting there at the back of the onboarding call, arms folded, not engaged on their phone. How are you going to engage that person, right? Because maybe that person's thinking of sabotaging the marketing campaign. Maybe they're not going to call the leads, right? Maybe they're going to tell everybody when you get off the call that this sucks and that we're the worst ever. And, you know, like you don't know. So give them situations that you actually are struggling with right now. And I think it's great because it gives you one insights into where would they naturally gravitate to so that you can either train better or, or move them in, the, in, a, in a positive direction. But it's also their opportunity to shine. Like I'm not there for me. I'm there for them. Like, I want to see what they're made of. What are they going to go and accomplish? What are they going to go and do? Um, it's my money I'm putting into this person. What are the, how are they going to spend it? Right. I think, I think that's a really important mindset to have. Love that. So you can get asking the questions, not like, Hey, what did you do in your last job? And how, how successful were you? But I'm really more about like in the current moment and where they're headed is more indicative in, in your mind. Yeah, I, I use the Lion King image with Rafiki where he hits him on the head and goes, it doesn't matter, it's in the past. Um, like, you know, I think one of the lessons I, I mentioned in one of the presentations is, you know, professional sports has changed so much. We used to overpay for what someone did, not for what they're actually going to accomplish in the last four years of their career, because obviously it declines, right? Right. I'm not paying you for what you did before. I'm going to pay you for what you're about to do in my agency. So that's why I'm really strongly feeling like the questions that you need to ask are about the challenges, the situations that you're facing in your agency right now. You're going to be surprised at how they answer it, good or bad. Um, I learn a lot sometimes from these people. And I think to myself, that's the person I want in that role, right? Are, mm -hmm. are they going to be, you know, we talked about the EOS, do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity for it? Ask questions that show you those things. We didn't just all pay a lot of money, right, to have that integrated into our agency to then ignore some of those foundations. Yeah, so good. Dan says, good morning. Good morning, Dan. Guys, if you've got questions on this topic of building your account management team, drop, drop them in the comments. It's, it helps to keep it creative and um, it, you know, really a productive conversation. So we talked about some of the questions you ask. So let's say you get that candidate that just seems like, man, this is a good candidate. I think they're a good fit. Um, what are the go-to assessments that you run and what are you looking for on some of those assessments? Yeah, so we run most of them through the the pretty typical ones. Um, Colby, Predictive Index. I usually am a big fan of giving homework assignments. Not something that is uh, expansive, but something that's pretty simple. Again, mm -hmm. it allows them to show me that they can follow direction, that they can be creative, right? And, and take a twist on it. So one of the things that we have in our program, it's, it's mandatory 
I actually am covering for a client success person today because they're on a holiday. And uh, I had to finish at the end of uh, a meeting with a client by doing a summary email and shooting a Loom video, right? Mm. Because not everyone was on that call. Two of the owners aren't involved. So I don't trust that Joe's going to go tell Karen and Kim like what happened. I'm going to take that control. So at the end of my interviews for client success and account management, I say, hey, um, we had a great interview here today. Can you recap this in an email and a short Loom video and tell me what happened? Go, go sell it. Right. Like go sell me on what you're going to showcase to Bref because Bref wasn't here on the call. Right. Bref, Bref is going to look at your application. He's going to look at your resume. And he's going to make a judgment. Is that the judgment you want him making or do you want to go out and inspire? Right. And and people that come in and they're, you know, they're kind of flat or they don't do it on time. That's that's already showing me how they're going to be successful or not in that role. The people that blow me away. Right? And again, agency clients know this is the first thing I ask you to look at is that, I mean, what are you, you're already feeling the excitement. You're already seeing the caliber of that person, but it's going to be, uh, unfortunately, only about three out of every 300 that are going to do that for you. Um, but that's what I'm going to acquire. I need mean, that mm. person, like we talked about before, are they responsible for 75,000 in recurring revenue? This is a really important thing for you guys to make sure that you're putting these account managers through in the consideration phase. I love that. I look kind of giving them some homework and seeing how they would send a follow. That's important, right? It's important that they follow up with your client and send a meaningful recap. You know, they could definitely show their aptitude for that right after the interview. I, I love that as an example. Um, assessments. You mentioned you run some of the assessments, but you didn't name any by, you know, specific. Um, I'm a big fan of DISC and Colby. Um, what, which ones do you like to run? Yeah, Colby, um, Predictive Index. Um, I haven't looked at this, but I mean, again, like I, I think the the thing with the assessments are again, they're a tool, right? Yeah. Are you are you looking for a red flag? Are you looking for most of the time when I'm doing those, it's either reinforcing positively something that I want to be reassured for, or it's opening my eyes to something I missed, right? And I think that a lot of the time, you know, we can hyper analyze, like you know, we ask them a question of like, what's their plan in five years? Oh, they want to build a business. Well. Don't ask that question then, right? Because like five years, like, do we know what we're doing in five years? Are we all going to still have our agency or have sold it or do something different? Like, I don't know. Um, it's five years away. I'm going to be more successful. But, you know, asking some Gen Z, you know, millennial kid that question, probably you're going to get an answer that you're going to be disappointed with. Um, so I think those objective assessments are really important because when you're in an interview, realize that you are subjectively evaluating them which is why I'm also a big fan of, I do an interview presentation. It's the same questions every single time to every candidate. It's rinse and repeat hmm. so that we could look at 10 candidates and evaluate them unbiasedly rather than, well, this person had this set of questions, this person had this plus that assessment. Are they both equal? I mean, you didn't actually fairly evaluate. So good, lots of, lots of great nuggets there. Super powerful stuff. Um, for me, the two things I look for on, a, on an assessment for, for this role uh, on DISC, I'm looking for a high I and D personality type. So I says they like being on the phone, they like talking, they enjoy the energy of other human beings. Uh, when we put an account manager in that role and they, they're low in, in interpersonal skills, they don't like it, right? They're like, I'm just going to email, I'm going to hide behind the technology and you can't have that in your account management staff. Um, and then the D, you know, dominance personality trait, they don't need to be a high D, but they need to have a little bit of a backbone. So when the client says, you guys broke this, this doesn't work anymore, you suck, we're getting terrible results, they can explain with confidence, well, no, actually we did this, this, and this, and here's where we're headed next. Um, if you have a wallflower as, as the front-facing person on your conversation, um, you know, they're going to get pushed around. Like your clients are you're typically spending a large amount of money, um, and they need to have that D personality type. Uh, for Colby, always, and I found this for every position in operations, especially account management, we're looking for high fact find, relatively high fact find, and relatively high follow through. Um, sometimes a quick start person, which is an entrepreneurial uh, trait, a high quick start person usually is, is pretty strong communication skills. They've got the look usually, and they're going to come in, and they're going to impress you. They're going to wow you. and like, wow, this is going to be amazing. Um, and then you put them in the role and two, three months down the track, they're bored, they're checked out, they're moving on. And so having that Colby assessment, knowing that they've got the follow through capability, which means, you know, they're going to stick around. They're going to think it through. They're going to be okay having repetitive conversations. 
And at least for a couple of years in the account management role, you can count on them to do that function. Um, I found that that uh, follow through function is really important. And the fact finding um, for digital marketing specifically, we want somebody that enjoys researching SEO, researching PPC, staying on the cutting edge. If they're not willing to, to research and know the trade, um, they're going to have a hard time communicating to the clients and, and convincing them that we're on the cutting edge and we're doing the right things. Um, and so I found those two traits, if you run a Colby assessment, if they're at least a six fact find and at least a six follow through, that's a really good indication. And again, don't not hire them based on that, but it is a good indication outside of just your subjective um, interview process. Yeah. No, one one great example there on the quick start, because I think that that's it's, it's not necessarily a reason not to hire someone, but it's a flag, right? Um, in our interview style, because we're using a presentation, we give them the opportunity usually to introduce themselves and kind of give an elevator pitch. We have found the highest quick start people want to dominate that interview and they're already asking questions about the role and something else. And we'll be like, hey, we already said, like, we're going to answer those questions at the end. This is your opportunity. So sometimes you can also use those tools to, you know, again, bring back in, in a better process into your interview. And, you know, one of our new recruitment associates had that issue last week where she was like, man, this guy just wanted to take over. And I'm like, quick start. I was like, he's out of the way. <laughs> and, I, and, and she was like, she's like, yeah, the rest of the interview was horrible. And I was like, you know, it's not his fault. He's just, he showed where his behavioral tendency was right away. And that's one of the things that you want to try to find out. Yeah, good stuff. There's a Facebook comment here. Unfortunately, I can't see the name, but they say, um, connected with you on LinkedIn. Are you a UWO alumni too? Yeah, so it's Western University here in, okay. in Canada. So yeah, I'll look at that LinkedIn uh, and I'll approve it. It's better than getting, uh, you know, prospected for you know guaranteed lead gen or something. Right, like which is ninety nine percent of all LinkedIn connection requests. They start with a a, a little hey, and then they want to they want to sell you by chat type of thing. Okay, so we've talked about um, hiring. We've talked about selection a little bit. Uh, let's talk about onboarding. So, you know, once you've got the account manager, it's, it's as important to just kind of ramp them up correctly so that they understand the role. What are some of your tips and tricks for onboarding and, and kind of training up account managers? Yeah. Get, get them trained by us first. Um, I mean, there you yeah, go. We're happy, we're happy to do that. But um, I think one of the things when you're starting out in, and I think most of us would agree with this, there's a certain way that we want something done inside of our agency. So if you're thinking about bringing on an account manager, I mean, it's inevitable for every single one of us when we start an agency that when we get to probably 15, 25 clients, we're probably like, hey, this is a good idea. So start recording some of the things that you love, that you do. Obviously, you know, if you're in some figure, you've got great resources already inside of the program. Um, I think making sure that you have, um, we, we, we give them what's called an, an owner handoff checklist. So, you know, make sure that you're really selling this person to the clients that you've built a relationship to. You're telling them like, Hey, we're making this investment. This is intended for you. As we grow, it's really important that you have someone that you can reach out to and get answers for quickly. It's not that we're bad at agency owners. It's just, you can only do so much in a day. I think one of the things that I notice a lot of the time is and the theme that I'm sharing, obviously, with everybody is you got to support these people. Um, they're only going to be as successful as you can support them. Um, so, you know, whether it's in a mastermind training program, whether it's something like we do privately, whether you have someone in your agency that can mentor that person, you got to be doing regular check ins. You got to be telling them and sharing them how they're doing. You're going to have to show them how to do stuff. I know that's really annoying because everyone's like, well, can't they just come in and do it every perfectly? Your agency is unique. Well, that's the theme we're talking about here. And it's going to be different between how I onboard a client versus Josh. The attitude is probably going to be the same of that person. But the technical components of how we do it, you can either do it really, really easy or you can do it really, really hard. Um, and I think a lot of the time, again, we're, we're hiring people too quickly and we're probably also training them too quickly and expecting mm -hmm. them to be successful, which is, in my opinion, sometimes unrealistic. If you're going to overpay, that person should be able to come in do the job at an expert level and be amazing. And Josh, obviously you've had experience with someone coming in and doing that for you. Um, but that's a unique person. I mean, that's not necessarily someone that um, you're going to find that easily. It may take you time to do it. Um, so what we did, and this is from years ago, that's what birthed the new agency for us is I, as I was training my account managers, I was recording myself doing that training and walking them through everything that we were doing. And that ultimately became our university. Mm. Super good, right? So you got to train them up. You've got to have an onboard track for them. 
Um, how long do you typically want to keep them in, in training mode before they start to get accounts and start to get productive in your, in, in your world? Yeah, so I probably want, um, my, my team probably has always wanted to poke their eyes out. Um, so like I'll give an example, we have about 14 recorded welcome calls um, in the first um, week that they have to watch. Then they have to role play. Then they have to present to me and I pretend to be an obnoxious um, client. And once they've really, just like sales, once they've demonstrated the ability, um, they understand the, you know, they demonstrate their understanding of why things are in a certain situation. Then usually what we'll do is we'll do a, a welcome call or onboarding call kind of co-hosted, right? So I'll lead the first part, they lead the second. Then, you know, usually the second or third one, they're leading 75% of the time. And I just don't take the training wheels off. I mean, my, my kids are just out of that, thankfully, phase where they had the training wheels on. But it's the exact same idea. You're not just saying to the kid, go, do it, right? Figure it out. You're sitting there and you're, you, know, you, you loosen one and then you kind of bring it up a little higher and you take one off. And then you're ultimately there. The, they're, going to, they're going to benefit from that mentality. I know that it's hard. I know that we just want everyone to get it. But remember, you get it because it's your agency. This is, this is what you know, you have the lived experience inside of your business. They're coming in, not having a clue how you've run this the last three years. And that's just my recommendation to everybody is take a deep breath and understand that they're, they're a puppy. You're going to have to spend time with them like a puppy. And if you don't want to, that's why you have agency growth. Team. Love it. I think a lot of gold nuggets here. I think the one thing that I hope you guys heard and that you write down and you implement is you can't just train them by watching videos or watching you and expect that they know how to do it, right? You shouldn't put them on a call with a client and be like, okay, show me you know what to do. There should be a step in between where you say, here's how it should go. Here's the flow. Go practice it. Now let's get on a, a simulation, a role play, and that could be at your desks. It could be both of you on Zoom and you practice them presenting to you and you give them feedback and then once they've got it you're like okay that was good enough they should they showed me they know how to pull up the report they know how to navigate it they know how to set the agenda they know how to ask the questions they know how to explain it then and only then then you say okay i think we're ready let's 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 do a joint call with the client this time you're gonna run it and i'll be on there and i'll be listening in and it doesn't have to be you as the owner somebody on your team or somebody like a service like like uh like Brad, you want them to do that role playing. Hopefully that landed, super important. And that's, that's extremely important in account management, but also important in your, in your sales process and other areas in the business as well. Yeah, it's like leaving a lamb in the savannah of Africa, right? Like, come on guys, like, you know, like, you know, maybe it's a really good, robust, you know, sheep, but I mean, it doesn't have a whole lot to defend itself. So um, I think sometimes you're right, we just, we're we're in the we're in the business of needing to move on to some other fire that's happening inside of the agency or some other you know kind of project that requires our attention. You just have to sometimes fight that and realize that this is the person who literally just so everyone's aware, this person is the face of your agency. That client is going to spend ninety seven, maybe ninety five percent of their time with that individual. You really, really need to nail it. Like that is really important because you're going to leave. And go and do something else and i mean yes we're all great at sales but it's far more cost effective to keep a client than it is to try to replace them with somebody new 100 percent. so lots of good insights there if you have follow-up questions drop them in um, i want to talk a little bit about like geography for account managers i've sure. always been or at least prior to interacting with you it's always hard pressed that account managers that are going to be client facing have to be United States or North America. They have to be native English speaking as their number one language. Um, and I, I was not willing to see a different perspective on that. You opened my eyes to you know international talent that can do this and, and do it better than the US talent in some cases. Talk to me a little bit about like where you find the best pockets to hire account managers and why you might consider international versus US and, and Canada exclusively. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think it's normal for every one of us to want someone local and somebody probably in like the like you know Canada or the US cuz I think again I mean like that's always the priority the challenge is you know they graduate from high university and they want a lot of money and then you train them up and then they leave for a better paying job at HubSpot or somewhere else right and then you kind of you know like there's that cycle that a lot of us get through where we we lose our best people and 
I think, you know, there's people that have, you know, now moved to different parts of the world. Maybe they grew up in the United States and now they're living somewhere else or they're from a, what I call a commonwealth country, right? They happen to, you know, English is a first language, a little bit of an accent like me, I'm Canadian, right? You guys aren't making fun of me for how I'm saying process very often. Um, but, you know, those are little, you know, those are little things that you can live with, right? I think what's most important, like I just mentioned with clients is you've got to have someone dependable, capable, and able to get to what you need them to do in a day. If that person happens to be from Tampa, wonderful. If it happens to be from Johannesburg or it happens to be from Caracas in, in Venezuela, if that person can come to that role at the professionalism that you need with the ability that you need, I don't know that you're going to actually get a client that complains. Um, I think where they're going to complain is when they're not coming prepared, they're, you know, you're having a hard time understanding them. They're spelling mistakes all over their emails. So I usually will say like, I'm looking for someone high class. Right. I mean, that's that's sometimes the easiest way to put it. I want someone who's probably educated. Someone obviously has a really strong grasp of English. I think if they're bilingual asset, if they come from a country where they've got a great experience with culture asset, um, time zone is going to be important. Like I said, you don't want them probably working at four o'clock in the morning, their local time yawning in front of a client. It's probably not a great idea. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like, look, if you happen to find that best person, you know, here somewhere in Houston or Los Angeles, bonus, amazing, right? Do that. Um, but don't also sell yourself short because there might be someone who's actually far more capable, far, like far higher drive, and they might actually be more affordable somewhere else. Um, and I just want agencies to have that open mind. I don't care where they come from. I just need them to do the job and do it at a very, very high level. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, great, great points there. I think our journey at, at Plumbing and HVAC SEO was we had an office in Miami. And so we had you know, 30 or so employees and everybody was in Miami. Like that was our, that was our hiring pool. And so we were limited to, at the amount we could pay, we were limited to recent high school, maybe like finishing college age people that didn't have any background, had to be trained up from the complete floor. And that worked, right? Because they were there every day and we got to build them up. But we had a revolving door because once they got enough training, they were able to take that skill set and go get money somewhere else. Right? It's like, hey, I've got three years or two years of agency experience. I'm going somewhere else. And even as we've raised our compensation for like localized talent, that we couldn't raise it to the extent that we needed to in order to, to remain profitable. Right? It, you have to, as agency owners, you charge a fee, and you know you have to ma manage your profitability. Like while you'd love to pay everybody $190,000 per year, there are economic constraints, right? We want these businesses to be profitable. And so when COVID hit, we were able to say, okay, we're gonna try hiring in the United States, right? We're gonna hire US people. And that opened a talent pool for us outside of the United States. We had similar challenge where once they've got enough experience, they, they do have more money opportunities outside. Um, and so Brad said, look, there's there's talent outside of the U.S. that's very competent with their communication skills um, and very driven. Like you can pay them less and it's actually more for them in their country because there's not as much economic opportunity. Um, and they, they will go to bat every day for your clients. They will upsell. They will have great, great outcomes. Um, and, that, you know, a lot of our, our account management team now is outside of the United States. Um, and we've got a very blue collar client base. They're plumbing and HVAC companies. They're not one man operations. Most of our clients are, you know, three to $10 million per year in revenue with the director of marketing that we're interfacing with. Um, and it's only come up once that they said, hey, did you guys like offshore your team because they noticed some of the accents, but they're, they're clean professional accents. We said, no, we're finding the best talent to step up and own your account regardless of, of proximity. Right? Would you rather have the best person in South Africa or someone that just happens to be in Pennsylvania but isn't very good? And they would, they, every client that's ever brought up is like, yeah, we want the best talent. Um, and it's not been an issue. Our client retention rate is, is the best it's been. We're, we're upselling clients at a rate we haven't before. We're getting more social proof than we have. Uh, and so I can tell you, uh, you know, Brad is, is really good at recruiting good talent. Like you can't just hire international and not get the right people, uh, but you know, also really good at, at, at getting the right people that can step in and, and economically work as you grow and as you scale. I agree. I think it just, it just comes down to, you know, early on, do what you can, 
do to afford the best person. And then, you know, eventually if you change your mind later and you're at a different profit, you know, position, then you can, then you can hire someone US based. I just, like I said, I just, if I can't get a US person to an interview because they're just like, why would I show up? And I have a list of a hundred all stars that want to come from somewhere. I mean, I'm just going to pick where the best talent's going to come from. Really good. Hopefully that lands for you guys. Don't feel like you're locked to your local market. Go where the best talent is and, and attract that talent to your organization. Um, I guess one last question I have on account, building this account management team philosophically that I think is important as, as you're listening and as you're thinking about building your account management team is do we want a customer service person or do we want a salesperson? And there's a big difference in the mentality of those two roles. Um, I would love to know your thoughts on this for your account management and client success team. Yeah. It's usually never been someone that's just all on one side or all on the other. Like I said, I'm most often looking for a generalist, right? That can, that has abilities in both situations. I'm probably going to train up wherever there's a little bit more of a deficiency than somewhere else. A salesperson is probably going to challenge you to earn absolutely maximum dollars. And listen, if you have an agency that's in a position where, you know, you can incentivize them for reviews, referrals, upsells. I mean, listen, if most of us are giving, say, you know, five to seven and a half, 10 percent of a commission um, to, an, to a sale, why aren't we doing that through our, our account managers if they're upselling, right, or bringing in another client? So, um, you know, carrot stick, I think a lot of the time, you know, a pure customer service person is going to be happy keeping clients happy. Um, I'm interested in growing my business, which means that I need that client to stay happy so they stay. But ultimately, I mean, I want almost every client in a perfect world every 24 months increasing, you know, by 10% what, what we're earning from them. Um, if that's your first hire and they're just a client success, customer service focused only person, then add somebody who's a little bit more driven secondarily. Just like, just know with the salesperson that they're going to maybe just be a little bit, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like how they all tend to be. Um, the, just study the time that they spend with your clients. That's why we were talking about the questions that you ask in your interview are going to be important because they're answering thinking that they're going to get the job and you're really just asking questions related to how they're going to do the job. And that's what you need to be evaluating. Love it. I, I think that this was an important lesson for us as we grew our account management team. I was always also kind of focused on my sales guys or sales guys. They're hungry. They're going to earn commission. My account management team, I just want them to be customer service. I just want them to be nice to the clients and have those conversations. Um, what I have kind of discovered, you know, as we've grown the team is that putting someone with a sales orientation in your account management team, they, they know, like, they're not trying to be a salesperson full time, but they have that sales orientation makes a big difference because they can resell the client on why they're with you. They can sell the client into other other services and actually increase the revenue from the client base. Um, and they can sell the client on creating testimonials and giving you referrals. Like if you can find someone that that has that sales ability and actually hire for that, it's going to pay dividends in terms of your revenue growth, your retention rates, and and kind of the social good word that's going out uh, in the industry about your business. Excellent. This has been awesome, Brad. I know you're probably going to hop onto another call right after this. So um, I just want to say you always, you know, as you're looking to grow, you can always be asking, how do I do this? Are you can ask how, or are you can ask who, right? And let's face it, for some of us, how's the only option? I got to figure out how to hire. I got to hire. I got to figure out how to recruit. I got to figure out how to train, but that's like writing a blank check. And you never know how much it's going to cost. And you probably aren't going to do it right. If you're an entrepreneur, a quick start, and you're thinking about growing your business, you're thinking about hiring, you're thinking about operations, you, you know, eventually it's not going to be done correctly. And I, I think for a, a role like this, it's much better to ask who. Who already knows how to hire these roles? Who already knows the questions to ask? Who already has a talent bank of people that are, are kind of pre-positioned for this type of role? Um, and I don't know any better who for hiring your account management team and training them up than Brad and agency growth team. And so, you know, if you've got some financial resources and retention is actually a key for you right now, um, I highly recommend connecting with Brad, letting them help you place the talent and train the talent. Um, it'll make a big difference in the, in the growth in your agency. 
Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just give a plug back to you that if you're inside a seven figure, you can book a, a coaching call with me to talk about how to do that on your own. We also have an amazing set, I think now five, four or five classes that we've recorded inside of the members area. Um, so there's no reason not to try to do it yourself. Josh is right. It just, it comes down to the decision of your time and what's that worth for you. So thanks, Josh. Thanks, Brad. This has been awesome. Good stuff. Congratulations on your growth. And thanks so much for sharing here publicly and, and sharing with the seven figure agency community um, and everything you're doing to coach our members on how to improve retention and grow their account management team. Thank you. Have a great time. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you've got follow-up questions, post them in the comments. Both Brad and I will be watching the comments. And if you got value, please reach out to Brad, tag him, share some love, um, and, and appreciate his abundance mentality. Thanks, everybody. I do have to run.